everyone. Welcome to the lecture on chapter one of corporate income tax. There may be multiple videos, we'll just see, but the lecture for chapter one is fairly short. So chapter one is really just meant to be an overview, an introductory chapter. It is not heavy on numbers, not heavy on problems. Really what we're trying to do in chapter one is to make a bridge between what you learned in individual income tax and link it to corporate tax. We don't go too much into the concepts because that's what we have the rest of the, the, rest of the semester for. Um, so with that, um, let's go ahead and, and get started. And you'll notice tonight that we will be talking about not just corporations, but we'll be talking a little bit about partnerships and disregarded entities as well, just because it's good to have an overview of all the different entities um, before we focus our attention the rest of the semester on corporations. So, um, one thing I would definitely like to point out to you, if you are on D2L, each chapter has a set of um, lecture outlines. Um, these have all been typed manually. They did not come with the book. Myself and someone else has, you know, over time typed up these materials and updated them for law changes. Um, I highly, highly encourage you to go and print those off and have, you, have them beside you. If you do not now, please pause it and go do that. Um, it will be very difficult to follow along if you do not have it. One of the um, comments that I got over and over again last semester when I taught this class was we loved the lecture outlines. They were so helpful. You know, thank you for giving those to us. So please take advantage of that. Uh, go print them off and have them next to you. I know that this book is a little bit wordy and difficult to read. The truth is all books on corporate income tax are difficult to read. I also understand that this book is actually a law textbook, not a book for accountants. Here's the thing. The school asked me to teach a class on corporate income tax, which means a three credit class on corporations. The books that are out there in the accounting world are really made more for classes that are a survey of taxation of all business entities. So they do not go into enough detail on just one entity. And I spoke to other people who teach this type of class in um, other accounting programs and they've all said the same thing. You need to use a law textbook or you need to make something yourself because the accounting books that are out there are not sufficient for a three credit class on corporate tax. So with that in mind, we are going to use a law textbook. As you are going through the textbook, you will notice that there are some cases, not a ton of cases, believe me, not for a law textbook, but there are cases in here. I don't want you to focus on reading the cases. You can get bogged down in all the facts and the details and some of them are quite lengthy. Um, I do think it's very important for tax accountants to be able to read and interpret cases. Don't get me wrong. I have said that in all of my classes. It is very important that you can read and understand cases because you're going to be doing a lot of research if you're planning on practicing in tax. And part of that research involves being able to read case law. But this class is difficult enough without adding in all of that. I want you to make sure you understand the general gist of the cases. Um, honestly, a better place to do that is Google. These are all pretty big famous cases. Google the case and you can get the important information from it rather than reading 10 heavy pages in the case book on it. Now, if we were in law school, yes, you would have to read it and then you would stand up and I would ask you questions about the case during class. But we're not in law school, so that's not what we're going to do. The things I want you to focus on when you read the book, and you absolutely should read the book. There are notes after cases, um, but sometimes, like in this chapter, chapter one, there aren't really hardly any cases at all. So really, you should read all of it. 
But like I said, don't focus too much on the cases. Read the notes after the case. Read the, um, the information from the authors. That's the kind of thing that I want you to focus on when you read the book. Um, because I'm not sure if I'll actually be there the first week of class in the fall, I'm going to tell you some things that I might, you might already know. The exams, there will be three exams. You can basically bring in anything you want except for your cell phone and your computer, and you can't talk to your neighbor about it. Um, anything else, uh, you know, no iPads, I guess I would say, no electronic devices. So, by anything else, you're free to bring into the exam. I encourage you, you know, bring the lecture material, bring your code and reg book, that's important. Don't get too bogged down. You need to make sure you know how to do the material before you get into the exam or you will not finish. But don't get too bogged down in it. Bring everything you can. Um, my exams are very similar to the questions that we do in class. If you know how to do those questions, forwards and backwards, you will do excellent on the exam. Um, of course, I change the numbers, I change some of the facts. I also have a tendency to merge questions. And that's not really to make your life more difficult, that's actually to make your life simpler so that you don't have to constantly be readjusting to different fact patterns in the exam. I want to stay with the same fact pattern as long as possible because getting acclimated to the facts is half the battle in these problems. Um, and I also have a tendency to do, you know, I do a couple multiple choice questions on the exam too. It'll be a fair mix between multiple choice and short answer. It's definitely more short answer heavy than multiple choice. But with the multiple choice questions, instead of focusing on problems, I focus more on, um, you know, overarching concepts that we have discussed in class. So it's kind of a way for me to test on things that maybe we didn't necessarily do a problem on, but I did speak about it in class. So I do use multiple choice for that purpose, and then I use the short answers to test you on the problems that we do in class. You'll also notice on D2L that the problems, um, the problems are in the book, okay? But the solutions manual has also been posted to D2L. As you are working the problems, and I encourage you to work them before you come to class, try to get through as much as you can. I tell students that if you can get through 60, maybe 70% of the material on your own before you get to class, you will be in a much better position. You will not be sitting there in class, everything flying by like, oh, I don't know what's going on. But if you prepare before you come and you're 60% of the way there before you walk in the door, you should leave class at 90% of the way there, maybe 85. And then how do you get the rest of the way? You work the problems again. You read the material again. Um, it also may help you as you go along to outline the material. What I mean is you say, okay, this is what code section 351 says. These are the general rules. These are the exceptions. It might help you to have some framework for the guiding law. And please do not make the mistake. This is a law class. We are learning tax law because that's what tax practitioners do. We are learning the tax law through the code, through the regs, and then we are applying it to problems. At the end of the semester, you will have to apply it to you know, preparing returns. Most students find that preparing their returns is the easy part. But learning the law and applying it to fact patterns, that's what you're gonna get paid the big bucks to do, not to actually prepare their returns. Um, so we are going to spend the large, large majority of our time focusing on the law and the problems. We will spend about a class period, maybe a class period and a half talking about the actual forms. But for the most part, we're going to be spending our time talking about the law and applying it to facts, i.e. doing problems. So this may be a little bit different than other accounting classes you've had in the past. I've had a lot of students tell me that. It is very different. 
Um, but I have also had students tell me that the things they've learned in this class have really helped them on the CPA exam because a lot of the way that material is presented here is how it will be presented on the CPA exam and even more important, how it will be presented in practice. You're just going to get a bunch of facts. Some of them are relevant, some of them are not. You need to weigh through them, understand that your clients may or may not know what they're talking about and figure out what the potential tax issues are and ultimately come to an answer if possible. Sometimes there are more than one answers, some more than one answer, sometimes you need more facts. All these are relevant considerations. So like I said, I give you the answer key on D2L. There is no excuse to not be able to work through the problems beforehand and understand maybe 60% of it. Um, now, I will give you a warning. The answer keys are geared toward professors, not students. So the answer keys do go off a little bit on rabbit trails, or they'll say, um, hey, uh, this might be a good thing to mention, or well, what if this happened? They'll say that in the answer key, like they're changing the facts. That's really to give professors some guidance on how to do this problem. If I don't introduce that hypothetical in class, you don't have to worry too much about understanding it. So, um, and you'll notice that my answers that I give are much, much shorter than the book. Like I said, the book is intended to be very, very inclusive and is meant to be a guide for professors. I still think it's better that you have that than nothing at all, or basically just me answering problems in class. It's better that, okay, maybe you missed something I say, you can at least go back and reference it and try to find it in the book or try to find it in the answer key. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with the substance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so a corporation is a separate taxable entity. You have probably heard it said that corporations have two levels of tax. Well, why is that? Well, because at the corporate level, they're taxed on the income. And then when dividends are distributed, now the shareholders are potentially taxed. So we essentially have taxed twice. Let's compare this to a partnership or to a pass-through entity. You may, you may have heard subchapter C. All right, subchapter C. Subchapter C is a subchapter of um, the Internal Revenue Code that deals with C-Corps, where we will be spending the majority of our time this semester. And there is another type of corporations that are found under subchapter S. <clears throat> we will discuss these at the very end of the semester. These are called S corporations and they are passed through entities much like a partnership. Now what about a partnership? I realize that most of you have had very little exposure, if any, to partnership tax. I'm telling you that partnership tax, in my opinion, and in the opinion of most tax people, is the most difficult area of tax there is to understand. We are, this is not a class in partnership tax, so we're not going to be talking about it. Really only today. So with partnerships, we only have one level of tax, and that's when the income is earned. When income is earned, it is taxed to the partners. What about when the partners later receive a dividend or a distribution? We call it a distribution in the partnership world. That is generally tax-free. So the distribution, which occurs later, is usually tax-free, almost always. 
So we really only have one level of tax. It's when the income is actually earned and it's the partners that pay the tax. With a C Corp, which is where we will be spending the majority of our time, the income is taxed once to the corporation when it is earned and then twice when dividends are distributed to the shareholders. Um, there's also something called a publicly traded partnership. You may have heard of a publicly traded partnership because honestly, publicly traded partnerships are pretty big in Texas. Texas is the mecca for publicly traded partnerships. And I'll tell you why here in a minute. So most publicly traded partnerships are, they're, they're partnerships, but they are treated as, they're essentially taxed as corporations. So they're taxed twice. Really, the rationale is because, well, they're publicly traded. But there is an exception for this. We will allow, the code says, one level of tax is allowed on publicly traded partnerships if they have what's called qualifying income. All right, well, okay. What is qualifying income? It's a lot of different kinds of things, actually. But one of the big things that is considered to be qualifying income, you might can guess it, we're in Texas, oil and gas activities. So most of the big energy companies that are out there have a publicly traded partnership as part of their corporate structure because you get a lot of the benefits of being a partnership, but you also get the benefits of being publicly traded. It's a nice compromise. It can be a tricky question. What is qualifying income? It's highly subjective and honestly, there's not a whole lot of law out there. I've had to do a little bit of research um, on this issue before with a deal that came up and um, not a whole lot of law out there. There's, it's, it, honestly, this is coming to the attention of the IRS and there's more and more things that are coming out all the time. But for right now, um, Texas is the mecca for publicly traded partnerships because of this concept of qualifying income, which allows only one level of tax. So, um, one thing I would like to note about corporations that I did not mention before, you probably already know this, but with dividends, when the dividends are paid to the shareholders, the, the corporation does not receive a deduction. So no deduction to the corporation. That's probably about as far as I can go there. No deduction to the corporation. But, um, and honestly there's no deduction when distributions are paid either at the partnership level. <clears throat> One way that companies have tried to get around this whole concept of um, double taxation for C-Corps is by the creation of LLCs. So you have, I'm sure you have heard of LLCs, right? Limited liability companies. These are, limited liability companies are interesting because they provide a lot of tax flexibility. They are essentially corporations for um, state law purposes um, in, the, in that you get the benefits of being a corporation, limited liability and that sort of thing. But for tax purposes, they can actually be taxed a lot of different ways, four different ways. There's really only four ways you can be taxed um, for entities. Which leads me to my next point. Something I want to discuss that is not really discussed that much in the book, but I think um, it's something def definitely needs to be discussed. It's something I've lectured on a couple times to attorneys. And that is the difference of choice of entity 
with state law versus federal law. Federal being tax law. And we are only talking about federal income taxes in this class, okay? We are not talking about state income taxes. So when you hear about choice of entity, almost always people are talking about state law. What are the different entity options to create under state law? When you create an entity under state law, you file the required forms with the Secretary of State with whatever state you're in. Some of the options under state law, okay, we have um, LLCs. Make sure you can see that on the board. Okay, you have, we're about right here. We have LLCs, limited liability companies. You can have limited liability partnerships. You could have limited partnerships. You could have a corporation. You could basically have a general partnership. Now, a general partnership is not actually an entity at all um, under state law. You're not actually creating anything. You just